Hi everybody, welcome back to Barn Talk. I'm Glenn Thank Kennedy and my co-host here is Charles Moss. Glad to be back. So last time we were talking about uh, the flooding and uh, the walnut groves and the oranges. So Charles, tell us, uh, how, how was it like to farm during the winter? It was pretty rough. They had a rough time. If there's no ceiling, they smudged here and uh, the oils and they filled all the smudge pots with oil. And okay. as soon as it started getting down around 32 degrees, they started worrying, especially with the dew point. And each, each grove had a different temperature and the farmers knew that. They knew where the cold spots were. So they started lighting the smudge pots. And that's one thing the young people in high school had a little job to do. They'd get up, er they'd get up early in the morning or when they were called and they would light the smudge pots. But the real problem with smudging is if there's no, no area above, like a cloud area or a version area, the, it would go just straight up and you couldn't do much, much control. We just had one of, those, uh, air, one of those Santa Anas where there was no ceiling. And if we had that, we'd have to light up a lot of smudge pots and keep our fingers crossed. But if there was a ceiling, it would hold the heat down. And the farmers did quite well in saving their trees. Uh, many years ago, in the 50s, they smudged so much, they ran out, started running out of smudging oil. And they went up to Santa Barbara to get more oil. They weren't allowed at that time to burn tires. They did earlier in the years uh, before the war, but they stopped that. And they did save the trees and they saved, saved uh, the crop. Uh, we just had, as I mentioned, in Riverside, they had a frost warning and Riverside can get very cold. And it probably, they lost some fruit out in that area. Uh, we used to put underneath the doors when they smudged, we put towels. We put them around the windows because wherever air could get in, you'd have a streak of dark smoke come in. And if they did a lot of smudging, your house was turned dark brown inside. <laughs> and I remember going to school and if it was a heavy smudging time and they would smudge into, let's say seven o'clock in the morning, uh, your nostrils would kind of look a little strange with the dark coming out. And I remember getting drinks out of the water faucet. and It kind of had a taste to it. So everything was covered with smudge oil. And, but that's what it took to save the trees. Uh, what was amazing, I thought, is that a lot of the farmers went up to the Vice area, Wood Lake, Orange Cove, and they didn't take their smudge pots with them because by then they had to take a smudge pot that it reburned had a nipple on it and it reburned the smudge oil. Like a, uh, I wouldn't say a catalytic converter, but close to it. And I never understood, neither did the farmers. They used to talk about it. You could get the trees at least, oh, four degrees colder and they wouldn't freeze the fruit. And that seemed strange. So there was thousands of gallons of smudging oil saved uh, and the, the Farmers talked about that quite a bit. Why you could have a tree here and it freeze at a, a, a higher te temperature and you take it up there and you could, it wouldn't freeze. And in the 90s, they had a freeze in the San Joaquin Valley. By then, everything was put on electric, uh, instead of gas turbine wind machines, the Edison Company talked them in putting it all on electric. And underneath the trees, they had drip systems and they were on electric pumps. And if those two things came in, they could keep the orchards warm. But the problem was the freeze started clear on the other side of San Francisco and came clear to Bakersfield. And when everybody turned their pumps on and their wind machines, everything shut off. And of course, the citrus froze then. They just couldn't, there was no way to keep them warm. So that was kind of a disaster. And, uh, but uh, the smudging times was very, very uh, trying for everybody, but that was being in the citrus orchards and the walnuts. I know there were, there were smudging pots 
in the orchards, uh, walnut groves, I'm sorry. But see, we could flood them because they were made in the little coffer dams. So if they knew it was going to get quite cold, they'd just flood the orchards. And some areas had to light up smudge pots. So, Okay, so I have a couple questions. So was there a difference between the walnut trees and the orange trees? Yes, there was. Okay. And uh, the walnuts, the oranges needed smudging for sure. And the walnuts, a lot of farmers didn't because the crops were on. You see, uh, with citrus, if you lost your citrus orchard, and that'd be after the first of the year, you had to pick your citrus. You couldn't leave it on the trees or you wouldn't have a nice crop the following year. So that's why it was so important because all that labor of picking the oranges and have no market because the inside there's no juice. So you can see the importance of smudging and keeping them warm. So, so, so they couldn't, so if the oranges froze, you couldn't, you couldn't save them at all? You couldn't, no. you couldn't have frozen orange juice or anything? They were just done? Yeah, they were done. Okay, okay, they, they, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. there was just not enough juice, and the government would not let you sell those. The government okay. moved in and said, no, that was not quality juice, and most farmers agreed with that. That okay. was something, because if once you lost your quality and your reputation, like Sunkist and Vitapak, and that's the same with walnuts. If the walnuts, uh, if you didn't take care of your walnuts and smudge your orchard, you probably wouldn't have a good crop. So it made okay. a difference. But. So, so do they use smudge pot? So after after the walnuts and after the oranges, they started growing like uh, lettuce and cauliflower, and then you used to grow roses. Did, did you need the smudge pot for any of those? No, because we could flood the orchards or fill the trenches up with okay. water. And they weren't, and if they did freeze, like the uh, roses, or you got a kill on the top, lettuce could freeze. And if anything was in the ground and was not really high up, uh, it would burn them back and you'd have to replant. And once you did get beyond the spring, like this time of year in April, you were pretty well out of the cold weather. So okay. you just were careful. That's about it. But once you got a frost, uh, a lot of things happened. Okay. So if the oranges froze, were, was the tree still good? Or you just lost that crop for the year? You lost the crop for the year. That, okay. And there was no juice in them, basically. Okay. It was uh, just a hard. Uh, yes, you lost your crop. That's the problem with the taking a chance in farming. You can do everything correct all summer, everything. And you're just about ready to pick and you get a frost and your whole year of work is wasted, basically. Okay. And, and so we already talked about the, uh, the, the, the beetle that, oh. that destroyed. What else was there? Was there, and we, and we talked once about, uh, you know, how they used to spray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And was there any other diseases? Was there anything else that, that you, you had to deal with? Well, Termites loved walnuts trees, okay. and they also loved citrus, but walnuts was their favorite, and we'll talk about that. And how we overcame that was, you would go in, and you'd take a sickle, and you'd cut all that mustard grass, it wasn't very high by then, in the spring, away from your tree, and you'd take a broom, a pretty stiff broom, and you'd sweep off all the dust, and then you'd come back with a water tank and wash the tree off so it was clean. And you'd wait about a week, and they had these big pressure pots, and they'd hold five gallons, some hold 10 gallons of paint, special, they call it whitewash. Okay. It didn't do any damage to the trees. It probably had a little chemical in it. And you sprayed the tree, and you spray it about six foot, six foot high, and that would keep all the termites, especially in the ants, but termites and all the bugs, the beetles, and all the things that would make a tree uh, get sick and die. And that's every tree. Can you imagine beautiful walnut trees with all with the leaves on and a field of mustard grass about 18 inches high and all these beautiful walnut trees, trunks painted? There really wasn't much any prettier than that. Yeah, like the Norman Rockwell painting? Yeah, Rockwell <laughs> painting, yeah. And uh, it, they took special care. 
And that was important. That was something that was done with a lot of time and a lot of effort is to make sure that those trees were painted. And then they'd go through and they'd find large limbs that had termites in them. We have our little flying termites too. And uh, they just have to cut those limbs out and cut them off. And the trees, if it had a one that had termite problem, it was still doing well and you could save it. You paint the top of it with a tar and you tie it with wires up to another strong limb. Okay. And they, and you know, basically those limbs would hold for quite a while. And then in the fall, after the picking, you'd go through and cut off all the dead limbs and everything and you take them now they'd remove all that and they'd have a place where they burned them okay so they were very careful and try to get rid of the termites but i think some of those termites were long here before the walnuts but they sure <laughs> loved walnut trees same thing with citrus uh they would attack the, tr the trunk and they butt onto the citrus tree see the the bare root of the citrus tree is a different variety of citrus than actually what you're growing. And that's where the termites and the ants would like to work. So they'd go through and maybe two feet high would paint that with the same material. And uh, that would pretty well stop that problem on citrus. Boy, did they like walnuts. Okay. <laughs> you didn't bring walnut wood into the house or in a few years you might oh. not have a house. Ah, ah. So, very, very, very yeah. interesting. Uh, so. After the walnuts and the and the citrus, they, they drew flowers during the 50s, right? Yes, they did. So tell us about that, Charles. We, uh, over there on Sunset, there's a street. I think the only street that was named separate is called Roseway. Oh, Roseway. Yeah, and that was covered with roses in there. And it's a, roses are a two-year crop, and you plant a young little rose. It's a robin robin rose, and it's about six inches high. And it flowers, it grows all that year. And then you go through and cut it off. Now you buy a bud and you buy those from special nurseries and you might buy a Mr. Lincoln, a uh, iceberg or uh, any type of, oh, the yellow rose of Texas. That was one of the prettiest too. And you bought those buds and they weren't cheap. Yeah. And they would go through and they'd make a little slice and, they, and they'd make another slice the opposite direction, and they'd put that bud in there and wrap it with a rubber band. And in six months, you'd had that growing, and that was your, your rose for the year. And next, the following winter, you would harvest your rose. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and the, the robin, after you cut it off, after it grew and the roots got established, it never seemed to come back. But if you have a rose plant in your yard where you have a red rose coming out and the, the tree was a, supposed to be a yellow rose. That's the robin uh, of the first planting coming out. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. And roses, so, the, so they were, the, the, the roses were, uh, the family was the common family that, right? they ran all the roses here yeah, in West Covina? Yeah, they do were. You, do you know anything about that? Well, they seem to be on Glendora Avenue. Okay. The Conlins, and they kind of got it started. And they eventually moved out to bigger pastures. They okay. needed more land. And I don't think they owned any land, but that I don't know for sure. They moved up to Wasco, outside of Bakersfield. Okay. And that's a lovely place to raise roses. And they became quite large, and they were moving a uh, ranch into Arizona, but they had an action in the family, and it just uh, broke up. Basically. Okay, it was a very because serious. that's the street Conlon is named after, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then a Jim Corner came in about that time, and he started raising roses and learned how. And his rose farm was over on, remember the old duck farm on 605 yes, yes, freeway? Oh, how can you, <laughs> how can you, <laughs> how can you forget that? <laughs> and just south of that, he had about 20 acres. And, but that wasn't enough land. He would actually raise them in Wasco too. He had okay. hundreds of acres up there. And he'd raise the roses and they would dig them and bring them out. 
and bring them down here and trim them on band saws. You know the old meat saws they use? Yes, them? absolutely. He would trim the roots off to about six inches. They'd trim the top off, package it up in sawdust, and they went all over the United States. He was very yeah. famous for that. And, you know, he did that. He started that as a young boy when he was about uh, 18. And he's uh, he quit about four years ago, and he was ninety one. Wow! Never quit. He, wow, that's uh, that's amazing. He was. He was a, and he went to law school too, and became quite large. Yeah. And of course, now there's big nurseries and. Yeah, in, well, I I've seen some uh, pictures on the Historical Society uh, Facebook page, and Jim Harris has some uh, photographs of uh, Glendora Avenue. To California Avenue, right there on Merced, and you can see the old West Cove School. But there was nothing in between except uh, uh, Rosefield. Yeah, and it, it's 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 as beautiful as it comes. Beautiful. When when you see a whole field of roses, that's a that's a pretty sight. It is. There's nothing prettier. And uh, on sunset, they had five acres of Mr. Lincoln. That's the darkest red there was. Okay. And five inch five acres of St. Elizabeth, and then they had Iceberg, and then they had the Yellow Rose of Texas. Wow. And I don't know if the Yellow Rose of Texas is still around. I've looked for it and haven't seen it, but it was a beautiful yellow, and I, it'll come back in time. They go in yes. cycles. So, so yeah. okay, so did the Armstrongs ever get involved? Yeah, uh, they bought a lot of the roses. Okay, so they yeah. bought a lot of the roses. Okay. Yeah, and they raised their own roses. Now, see, the secret was you had to buy the bud from them. Okay. They they controlled the bud. And whoever developed the bud, and if you developed something like the Yellow Rose of Texas and patented it, that was yours, and you got a percentage, whoever grew it oh, and okay. sold it. So it was a, that was a private industry in its own, and actually some of those buds is half the price of the rose interesting it's uh because it takes years and years to do that yeah armstrong was a big role and okay. they have wonderful roses they would buy roses from you or have you grow them but they controlled the bud and they controlled a lot because they wanted quality roses that's okay. what i understand i i never got involved with them okay but uh they're good roles. Yes. So okay. So we had uh, we had the walnut trees, we had the orange trees, and we had the roses. And what else? Did, I know we had cauliflower and other things, onions. What else did we have? Well, I think the cauliflower is a good one. You know that when they planted the little, they grew the cauliflowers in a hot house or where in a where it was warm. Then they planted them, and they were probably about four four inches high. They went through and dug a little hole with a hole and stuck it in. They put a little white tin over it. Okay. And it looked like little teepees or uh, paint strainers. And that's to keep the frost off. So you could plant your cauliflower, but if you had a frost, see, it would burn that, the, and that would be the end of it. It'd kill the whole plant. Oh, okay. And it was kind of interesting to see 10, 20, 30 acres with these little tents over all the roses i mean all the uh, cauliflower and then of course as it grew it just knocked it knocked it off okay and uh cauliflower was a big crop here a very big crop uh who bought those basically was safeway store you remember the safeways I, yes i do yeah and they they liked west covina cauliflower that was about it and all that cauliflower had to be in the market before thanksgiving it had to be actually in the store. And if they didn't sell all of it during the Thanksgiving day, boy, after after Thanksgiving, everybody eating grandma out of house <laughs> and they wanted cauliflower too. So they yeah. didn't have any problem. And Christmas was a big time. Too. Yes. And that's another story we're gonna have to talk about how they pick cauliflower. Well, I, I would, uh, I know that we're running out of time today. Um, so I want to wish everybody a happy Easter. But I I want to, so we were talking about the Conlins and the street being named after them. I'd like to do a segment on on how the streets were named. That would and be great. We'll probably do that uh, uh, in the upcoming future. So with that, me and Charles like to say thank you. Have a happy Easter. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for being here.